As a society, we've become much quicker. Everything moves faster. We want instant gratification. So how do you make sure you give instant gratification to your customers when they're considering buying? Let's talk about that. Hi, I'm Daniel Burstein, Director of Editorial Content at Marketing Sherpa. We're here at the Marketing Sherpa Media Center at IRCE, and joining me now is Tammy Everts, a Senior Researcher at Sosta. Thanks for joining us, Tammy. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we're, we're at IRCE. I just went to get lunch, and there's about five or ten different places you can get lunch here. And I didn't choose based on what smelled the best. I didn't choose based on what looked the best. I was looking for the shortest line. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> and it sounds like, so from, from some of the data you brought us, it sounds like customers are also doing that when they're considering purchasing. Yeah, essentially, yeah, it's a good analogy. Um, we have found, I have found, in years of doing research into performance in terms of, of, of page load and user experience and then ultimately business metrics is that the faster pages are, the more people uh, spend time on site and ultimately the more they spend. Okay, so you want to tell us a little bit about the data we're looking at right now? Uh, yeah. Um, how did you collect it and how did you learn? How okay, did you so. It? Last, uh, last winter uh, at SOSA, I did a research project where um, I wanted to compare year over year uh, the impact of performance on conversions over what we were calling, kind of calling it Cyber Week, basically the, the week around um, uh, uh, Thanksgiving Thursday and then all the way through to Cyber Monday. I th actually, I think we carried it over to Tuesday. So okay. a six-day a six spread in 2015 and then the same six day spread in 2014. And uh, we dug into the real user data for 10 uh, IR200 retailers, so leading retailers, um, and I can't tell you which, which ones they are, but it's anonymized data, but ultimately um, almost two billion beacons worth of data for those two different years. And we correlated the impact of performance on conversions across um, the entire traffic distribution. So we, we broke it down into um, 0.1 second increments and just uh, figured out, okay, well, well, what's the impact of performance on conversions? And it was really interesting. We found that in 2014, 2015, um, when we did a distribution of all the page load times, we created a histogram, so for people who aren't familiar with, with, with data science, a histogram just represents a distribution of, of all of your measurements. And uh, we found that roughly load times were about the same year over year. So performance didn't really change much on the sites. What was really interesting, and you can see that actually on the blue bars for the 2014 chart and the 2015 chart. What was interesting so here though, we see the 2014 this is 2014, data, yeah. let's take a look at 2015. There's 2015, so the blue bars, if you, if you toggle back and forth, more or less the same. Maybe, the, the, maybe a little bit more to the right for, for 2014, but pretty similar. What's really interesting though is, if you think of the blue bars as just representing performance metrics, like the metrics that IT cares about, load time, um, the, that red line represents user experience and, and business. So what's interesting about that red line is in 2014, we found that, um, that if you see the load times there distributed across the bottom, that peak conversion rate was um, about 6% and it happened at about the 3.8 second mark. So for most customers, that was the, the, the pages that loaded in 3.8 seconds were the highest converting pages. And so that was, it was great, a lot of people had that experience and so you see that those blue bars fall nicely underneath that red line. In 2015, what's interesting is that that red, that red line shifts over really, really sharply to the left and we found that peak conversions happen at about 2.4 seconds and that the peak conversion rate was almost the same as the previous year. It was almost, it was almost six seconds, so close, close enough. And so what we saw was just in the space of one year with the same set of sites, um, the user experience expectations shifted to the left by about 37, 38%. So people expected pages to be faster. And that gap between the red line and the blue bars indicates kind of what I consider the opportunity gap. If we'd be able to move more of that traffic underneath the red line, obviously that would just be more conversions overall. The other really interesting thing on these graphs is um, if you think about, if you if you recall that uh, 3.8 seconds was the, the, so the sweet spot in 2014, in 2015, by 3.8 seconds, the conversion rate has dropped to just above 4%. So you see this drop from 6% to 4% in, in just one year. 
Yeah, and so I, I want to get to mobile in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but even for desktop, so I imagine that the time period you're talking about, this could be when some sites get hit with the most traffic and the most purchases they're going to get. You're talking about Black Friday, you're talking about Cyber Monday. Mm -hmm. So how can sites prepare for this, this massive load time coming at once? Um, well, testing is obviously a big part of it. So making sure that your pages are performant. Load testing is that load, what load testing okay. and performance testing. It's probably functionality testing, so okay. that you're not just releasing. Um, because often companies will um, they'll they'll lock down things on the on the back end, but they'll make design changes right up until you know they'll have a, a brand new site ready to go for 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 Cyber Week. And so making sure that you've actually done functional testing on those pages. I mean, the number one culprit uh, for, for most pages that I see is just images. Like they're, they're, they're not properly optimized, um, they're badly formatted, um, things like that. So that's, that's, that's a major culprit. And then third parties. Um, there's a, I, I did a talk with uh, Nordstrom about a year ago and uh, they shared a really great case study, a little internal story where they have a big anniversary sale every, that's every summer, so it's not a, but it's, it's kind of a, a Black Friday type event for them that happens every summer. And it's, it's a huge event. And one of their third party providers, not knowing that there was this big thing happening, um, made a change to the tag that uh, introduced a defect that actually messed up the, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was on the uh, checkout page. And so they noticed, fortunately in their war room, wait a second, suddenly people aren't converting. Like they're getting to checkout and they're just, it's just ending, people are leaving the site. And they figured out it was this third party tag and the, the, the vendor just had no idea that they were having this major event. So little, little glitches like that can happen. And if you're not doing testing and then if you're not actually monitoring your live site, during uh, during during these critical time periods, you can really you know you can, you can really have some problems. Okay, you mentioned images being a big culprit. What's well, something that can help there? Content delivery networks, or is there something else people can? Do? Yeah, so for images, there are a few things. I mean, making sure that people who who build your pages, um, everybody who touches the page, understands the impact of of, of, of images specifically on performance. Um, so a CDN is a way to uh, make sure that you are caching images closer to your users, so that um, so that that it has you know less distance to go and you have less latency. Um, another one is just ensure that um, all your I images are being properly cached by the browser. So just setting your 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 browser cache, or sorry, allowing your images to be cached, so enabling caching. Um, and then another one is just as I was saying before educating the people in your organization about the impact that all of these bits and pieces have on the page. Um, there was a retailer that I consulted with about a year ago, and I, I'm not going to name any names, but they asked me, look, we know, like, this is, this is, these are people in the, in the e-commerce department, our pages are suddenly slow. We have no idea why. Our home page is brutally slow. And I did a quick web page test, which is just this free online synthetic measurement tool people can use. And, um, quickly discovered, based on this long blue line on their waterfall chart, that they had a rogue animated GIF on their homepage. And it was a really awesome animated GIF, but it was taking 20 seconds to load and it was blocking the rest of the page from rendering. And so th this had been introduced to the page because somebody thought it was really cute, and if they were, you were looking at it on your own desktop and it was cached in your browser, it would load really, really quickly. But out in the wild, for, for you know regular internet users who are coming to your site for the first time, it was taking those 20 seconds to load, and they just they just didn't realize that that that, that a, an animated GIF could have that kind of performance impact. Yeah, I mean, another thing I've seen on a lot of e-commerce sites is you talk about third-party tags. Is mm -hmm. sometimes you know people change in the organization, and in a legacy site, you don't even know what tags are on there that are slowing the page down. Does it make sense to do an audit of your site and understand all the different third-party calls it's making? Yes. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the number one things that I advise people to do. Um, you get these ghost tags sometimes on your pages that nobody even knows who put them there. They're years <laughs> old, and sometimes they just create this infinite loop of redirect. So they just redirect off into nowhere, or they redirect back to something that was earlier in the tag. Um, one, of, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I research and, and, and talk about sometimes are uh, not even third-party tags, like what we call them fourth-party tags or nth-party tags, because you can use a third-party tag management tool to, act, to, to identify all the tags in your page, and there are a few good ones that are out there that are free that you can try, like, like Ghostry, for example. And 
you um, can pop out the waterfall diagram and see, okay, it's a third party. Well, what is it called to? It calls to a whole bunch of fourth parties. Well, where do those fourth parties call to? And so on. And the highest I managed to count before I kind of broke the system was 17. And then, and, and, and they were kind of calling back to, to previous places in the, in the series of calls. And the problem with that is, A, there's obviously a performance issue if these are blocking the rest of your page from rendering, or just they're introducing a lot of weight to your page. But there's also a security issue as well, that these, you know, sometimes these, you can start with a secure tag, and then it goes into unsecured land, and that can actually leave you wide open to man-in-the-middle attacks and, and, and those types of attacks. And when you talk about a waterfall diagram, so everyone understands, I assume you're in the waterfall diagram, you're looking at what's loading when and how long it's taking to get the full page loaded. Exactly. Right? It's a, if, if people are familiar with a Gantt chart, it's kind of like a Gantt chart for all of the elements on your page. So when you think about the fact that the average web page has 100, 200, for retail sites, I've seen, you know, three or 400 is, is, is the norm sometimes. Different elements, so that's HTML. CSS, JavaScript, every individual image, all of those pieces are parsed out separately. And you can see what the waterfall diagram does really well is just shows the interdependencies. You know, uh, the average browser can only download about eight things at a time. And so you see where, um, the, what, what are the first eight things to download and what's waiting for those to finish downloading before the next pieces can start to download. And it's a really, really handy tool. And I highly recommend that people check out tools like webpagetest.org that let you generate waterfalls very easily just by entering your URL or anybody's URL for that matter and, uh, and, 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 and getting that kind of graphic. Okay, let me last ask you about mobile specifically. So we have 4G now, we have Wi-Fi now, but you know, a lot of designers, a lot of coders, you know, they're testing on the super highest speed, you know, landline on the super fastest computers. Mm -hmm. So what would you advise to designers, really any brand marketer, about mobile specifically to increase load time? Um, so it's funny, you actually raise a good point, and one of the things that I uh, would recommend people do is actually try to see their mobile site or experience your mobile site the way a regular person would, or not even a regular person, like somebody who might be in the bottom 50th you know, percentile of, of internet users. So Facebook has something called 2G Tuesdays, where they, it's, you, can, you can opt out of it if you absolutely must have you know, good performance on those days, but where they want everybody to use a throttle connection, so they artificial throttle, artificially throttle the connection for everybody in the office, and you do that for a day. And it's to create, a, and other companies do something similar, they call it different names. Um, and it's just a way to create awareness amongst your developers, marketers, everyone, that this is actually how a significant proportion of the world's population experiences your site. And so if, part of, if your business plan is global domination, you actually need to think about how the globe experiences your, your, your website, and that can vary really wild, wildly. Um, in terms of other tips for mobile, um, I think just having that level of visibility and awareness, recognizing that um, in all of the research that I have done on the impact of performance on, on uh, user experience and on business, um, people's mobile expectations are about the same as they are for desktop. So we can't assume that people have downshifted their expectations for mobile. They might tell you they have because everybody knows you know, intuitively that mobile is slow, but what people tell you in a survey, if you say, do you expect mobile websites to be slow? Most people say yes. Would you be, expect to be more patient? Sure but actually the, the data doesn't, doesn't uh, play that out. The data shows that actually people are just as impatient on mobile as they are on desktop. I know I'm more impatient on mobile because I'm out and about and just want the thing I want, right? Exactly, yeah. and you know, you're, you, and sometimes you're on mobile, what, what, what fuels that impatience is just the fact that you're not even sure if the page will load. So you have this, like on desktop, you know the page will load eventually. You know, maybe there'll be some outlying situation yeah. that keeps it from happening, but on mobile, you just there's that increased level of uncertainty, and then there's just the fact that there's a lot more going on in your environment, so yeah. Awesome, well thanks for sharing your data and your charts yeah. with us, Tammy. Thank you, it was great being here. And thank you for watching, and you can see many more videos at marketingsherpa.com slash IRCE.